It's a great pleasure to introduce today's plenary speaker, Ronit Rubenfeld. Uh, Ronit is a professor of computer science at both MIT and Tel Aviv University. Since her graduate days at Berkeley, she has been doing beautiful work on self-correcting structures of various sorts, on learning theory, and on uh, testing the properties of strings and graphs using minimal resources. Um, today, she'll be talking about what can be achieved in sublinear time. Um, before we begin, though, um, uh, Ronit, I've been instructed to, um, to give you um, a present. Uh, I'm not really sure what it is, but um, maybe, <laughs> Thank you. maybe you could open it up and um, we could take a look. Any guesses? Yeah. All right, this is going to be something for nothing because we'll see what the, the talk is. Oh, wow. What a surprise. Do you want to see it? There you, <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about algorithms for big data. And I really love this term, big data, because um, first of all, I used to say I work on algorithms for massive data, and this is shorter, and I like short. <laughs> and secondly, because in some sense, we all work on algorithms for big data, because we're all, you know, we're all pushing the boundaries of what do you do when you have more data than you have resources. And in some sense, this is a great buzzword because it covers all of us. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about what sense it covers me um, and the people that are in the area that I work in. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is what, I'm going to start with a number of models in today's talk. The first group of models I'm going to talk about are what happens when you have no time to look at all the data. Okay, so what can you even possibly hope to do if you can't view all the data? Let me just put an example in your head, just as a running example to think about while we're talking about this problem, just to make it a bit more uh, concrete. So we've all heard of this small world phenomenon, the six degrees of separation. There's been a movie, a Broadway play, you know, this is famous stuff. Um, and we like to model the world as a graph. Each person gets a node. We put an edge between two people if they've met each other. And we say that the six degrees of separation property is when is the question of whether all pairs of people are connected by a path of distance at most six. Okay, so that's for us the graph theory term. How in the world could you check if the world really satisfies this property? What are you going to do? Go around to each person and ask them who they know? Okay, so there's a number of problems because even if you could go to each person in the world and ask them, do you know, give me a whole list of all the people in the world that you know, um, the accessible data, how would you know that you got all the people? I mean, we keep finding groups of people in the Amazons that nobody's ever talked to, uh, and we didn't know they existed. People could, by the time you collect all this data, somebody could die or be born, that could change the property. Once, um, so we have a number of problems with vast data, and it makes us wonder, oh, thank you, great. Thanks. It makes us wonder whether this notion of linear time algorithms is actually a good notion. I mean, this is the notion we teach in undergraduate algorithms. We tell people, once you get a linear time algorithm, you can stop and move on to the next question in the test. Right? You're done, gold star. Okay? But maybe in this situation, it's inadequate. So what could you possibly hope to answer? We're going to have to change our goals. Okay, we're going to have to give a little bit. Um, we can't answer exactly and for all type statements. For example, we cannot answer whether all individuals are connected by six degrees of separation. We cannot answer exactly how many people in this world are left-handed. That even doesn't make sense as a question. Uh, so we have to make a compromise, and the compromise could be, here's, let me propose a couple of compromises. Is there a large group of people that are connected via six degrees of separation? Approximately how many individuals in the world are left-handed? This is a compromise that I believe is well, whoops, uh, this is a compromise that I believe is uh, what we do. You know, that's what we've agreed on. Okay, so 
What types of approximation do we want to talk about? I'm going to talk about two types of approximation. One that is appropriate for what we call decision pro problems or properties of data. And the other, which is the normal type of approximation, there's some number and you want to get a good approximation to it and you can talk about multiplicative or additive, whatever you want. So let's start with the first type. This we're going to call property testing. So we're interested in knowing whether an input has certain crucial properties. What those cr properties might be, anything. Okay, it could be a point set and we might ask, is it clusterable? It could be a graph, we might ask, is it small diameter? It could be a large string of bits, we might ask, is it close to a code word? Okay, there's a number of properties of data we could ask. And what we want to do in this case is not determine whether the input has the property, but determine whether it's in the ballpark or out of the ballpark. Okay, so what we're going to say is you should distinguish inputs that have the property from those inputs that are far from having the property, those inputs on the border, whatever you want. Okay, because they're close to having the property, so you might as well say they have the property. But um, they're also not far from having the property. I mean, they're also, they don't have the property, so it's okay to say that they don't have the property. So whatever answer you give is reasonable. It's okay to say they don't have the property. Okay, so why won't you do this? Well, you can answer such questions much faster. And we'll see examples now where much, much faster um, algorithms exist for such weakening questions, weakened questions. Okay, secondly, that might be the right question to ask when there's noise present or when the data is constantly changing or when you want a fast sanity check to rule out really bad in inputs before you spend a lot of processing time on them, okay? And finally, I want to mention there's this model selection problem in machine learning which essentially says, okay, is this data, before I learn the separator, is this data separable, you know? So th there's a lot of places in machine learning where you actually would want to know which machine learning algorithm to apply to the data. So these are, these, these are motivations for this type of question. Let me give some examples. If I have the input to output table of a function, I can test if the function is a homomorphism in constant time, independent of the domain size. Okay, so in the sense I can pass functions that are homomorphisms, fail functions that are epsilon far. Um, for the social network problem that we talked about before, we can test if a graph, if the social network has the six degrees of separation property also in constant time. Okay, how do these properties testers work? Well, first what you have to do is find some kind of characterization of the property that is efficiently testable, often we call it locally testable, but it means there's some sort of efficient test you can do, usually random sampling. Um, and you need to have that this property is robust. So what do I mean by robust? First of all, objects that have the property should, have, should satisfy this characterization. That would be good, okay? Secondly, this characterization should fail objects that are far from having the property, meaning, um, any object that's far from having this property should be very unlikely to pass these types of algorithms. And usually that's the bigger challenge because what you need to prove is if the input object is such that it's likely to pass the characterization, then it actually is close to having the property. Okay, and you need to give a mathematical proof of this when you give the property. Okay, let me give an example. I'm not going to give the proofs, but just the examples of, these are just a couple of not that randomly chosen examples of what's known. Um, what if I want to test whether a function is a homomorphism? There's a very large domain. This function is defined over an extremely large domain. What should I do? Well, I can't go and test for all pairs x, y that f of x plus f of y equals f of x plus y. I cannot do that. Uh, another thing I cannot do is, let's say I knew f on some generator. I can't test. Um, Oh, I can, I, can, I, can, I can test that for all x, f of x plus f of 1 equals f of x plus 1. That might be something I could do, but that takes forever too. So what if I just want to test that for most x, f of x plus f of 1 equals f of x plus 1? That's also bad. That's efficient. It's very efficient, but the problem is there are functions that would pass this test. There are functions that pass this test that are very far from being homomorphisms. So that's a bad characterization. But here is a good characterization. For most x, y, for the proper definition of most, and most is like some constant, um, I think it has to be at least 7 ninths, um, f of x plus f of y equals f of x plus y. 
Okay, so as long as most is big enough, this is a good characterization. Only functions that are close to homomorphisms can pass this test. Okay, so that's an example. Six degrees of separation, similarly, what's a, here's a bad characterization of six degrees of separation. For every node, all other nodes are within distance six. What's bad about it? It's not efficiently testable. Another bad one. For most nodes, all other nodes are within distance six. Also, not efficiently testable. Um, a, a good characterization, though, is that for most nodes, there are many other nodes within distance six. Okay, and that turns out to be something that you can write a fast algorithm to compute this, and it act, you can show that it's a good characterization. Only good, only good graphs pass this test. Okay, so that's two examples. I'm not going to give too many more examples. What I'm going to just try to get across now is in the area of property testing, many properties have been studied. So graphs, functions, point sets, strings, um, and there are, you know, I'm very lucky to have a number of amazing colleagues. These people have shown amazing characterizations of the problems that are testable in the graph and function testing models. So these people have done, I, okay, let me just uh, highlight some things here. Um, so people have looked in, the, in terms of testing functions, people have looked at linearity and low degree polynomials. Uh, monotonicity, convexity, submodularity, low complexity functions, functions that depend on small numbers of variables, we call them juntas. But actually there's a whole characterization, all locally characterized affine and variant function classes are testable. Constant number of queries. I mean there's a whole beautiful characterization of large classes of properties that are testable. For graphs, the story is even more characterized uh, in the sense that for dense graphs, meaning graphs that are represented by adjacency matrices, we know exactly how to characterize what's testable. However, it, we know, except that um, it's kind of complicated for me to explain, it has to do with sem Semiretti regularity partitions, so I'm not going to explain it. I'm just going to say that it includes all graph families that are closed under, I know I'd forget the word, um, a, when you remove a node. Miners, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, so I knew that I have a mental block today. <laughs> and that, hopefully that's the last one, but we'll see. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So all dense, so, so it includes all of these um, graphs closed under minors. Um, the, and they're all testable in constant number of queries. Another class of graphs, which is not dense, are hyperfinite graphs. These are graphs which I think of as kind of opposite of expanders. They, they never expand too much. Uh, these are sparse graphs. These include things like planar graphs and all kinds of uh, minor free graphs. Um, these all properties of hyperfinite graphs are testable. Okay, so that's actually a very recent result. Um, as far as general sparse graphs, which are not necessarily uh, hyperfinite, there's been a lot of work, this isn't all of it, but people have looked at various specific properties. Um, there we have less of a knowledge of what classes of functions are testable, but there is a lot of individual properties that have been considered. So I just want to mention that a lot of beautiful tools have been applied to these problems, uh, Semiretti regularity lemma, random walks, local search, um, and a few that I'll talk about in later slides. Okay, and then I just want to emphasize that we haven't stopped at functions or graphs, but we've looked, people in the community have looked at set properties, string properties, metric properties, and codes, and all sorts of other objects. So finally, I want to say that there's been a very recent work that's tried to push the boundaries of property testing in a direction that makes it useful for machine learning. And this work on active property testing said, okay, we'd like to use We'd like to do property testing for the model selection problem in machine learning. So we'd like to say, is this a good model? I mean, is this function behaving like a half space? Uh, is that a good model to even use? The problem is the machine learning people don't like this model where you can query the value of any point in the data set. Um, and that's reasonable. Uh, they say you don't have the answers for every point in the data set. So this model attempts to bridge the two worlds by saying, okay, what you get is we're going to sample a whole bunch of points, but we're not going to give you the answers for those points. We're going to sample a number of points in the, in the data set. We won't give you the answers, and then you get to pick of my sample which ones to query. Okay, And that is an attempt to bridge the gap between the property testing models and the machine learning models. 
Okay, so that's um, very recent work, and they have some beautiful characterizations of what's in, what you need to have in a, in a property in order to make it testable. Okay, I'm going to turn now away from property testing and into classical approximation. Here, you want to output a number that's close to the value of the optimal solution, but there's not going to be enough time to actually construct a solution. So for example, if I want a minimum spanning tree, all I'm going to do is approximate the value of a minimum spanning tree. I'm not going to tell you which edges are in it. Okay? I'll talk about that problem later. But right now, all I want is the value. I want an approximate value. And a number of problems here have been looked at too. MST, vertex cover, max cut positive linear programming, and edit distance. I'm going to talk about an example of vertex cover where a lot of recent work has gone into it. Um, just to remind everyone what a vertex cover is, uh, if I have a graph, a vertex cover is a subset of the nodes that touches every single edge in the graph. And the minimum size of a vertex cover, this is the parameter we're interested in, Determining that is NP-complete, but there is a good multiplicative two approximation for this problem. We, that we can solve in polynomial time. Um, and it's based on the relationship between vertex cover and maximal matching. Okay, you don't even need maximum matching. You just need maximal matching. Okay, what did I do? Wrong side. Okay. Okay, so in fact, it turns out that any maximal matching um, gives you a two approximation to vertex cover because a vertex cover has to include at least one node from any edge in, the, in a maximal matching. And furthermore, the nodes of the maximal mat matching, if you take any maximal matching, both end, and you just throw in both endpoints of each one, that gives you a vertex cover. Okay, and that's by the maximality of the matching. Okay, so this is easy to see. Um, and we're going to use this to get a constant time approximation for vertex cover on sparse graphs. Okay, so sparse graph, let's say that the degree is bounded by a constant. In this case, we're going to output a y, which is at most twice the optimum value. So this is the, this is the a multiplicative error that we're going to get. And we're also going to get a bit of an additive error. Okay, so this too comes from the fact that we're using the relationship between vertex cover and maximal matching. And there we already lost a factor of two. Then we're going to do some sampling and we're going to lose an additive epsilon. Okay, so it's a multiplicative and additive error that we get here. Uh, just to make, um, okay. So how do we do this? We're going to use the Oracle reduction framework of Parnas and Ron. And what it says is we're going to construct this Oracle. Okay, and this Oracle is going to tell you if node u is in the two approximate vertex cover. This Oracle has in its head a specific vertex cover Okay, so this oracle has to be consistent. You know, if I ask about u and I ask about v, it's got to be talking about the same vertex cover. Okay, but this oracle has in its head a vertex cover, and it's going to tell me for each question, for each node u, whether that one's in the vertex cover or not. Okay, and then once I have that kind of an oracle, then I can just use standard sampling, call the oracle, and, and estimate how many nodes are in the vertex cover. Okay, so this second step here is trivial once I have the first step. The question is, how do I implement this oracle? Okay, so I'm just going to give you a high level for how to do this. There's two approaches, and both of them have been used to get algorithms. One is this really cool idea of noticing that some of these problems have really fast distributed algorithms, constant round distributed algorithms. And when you have a constant round distributed algorithm, well, from the point of view of any node, if, if I know I'm going to know my answer within constantly many rounds, then my answer can only depend on my neighborhood that's a constantly far away from me. Like if, if, if I have a K round protocol, then, and my degree is D, then there's at most D to the K nodes that could affect me in K rounds. Okay, so I'm just going to query each one of those D to the K nodes. Remember, K is constant. Okay, I'm going to query each one of those d to the k nodes, figure out what their inputs are, and then simulate sequentially what my answer should be. Okay, and that gives a good answer. It's exponential in the degree, but it gives you a way of, of getting vertex cover. And it's constant in terms of n, the number of nodes, but it is exponential in terms of the degree. Okay, the method I'm going, the way, the method I'm going to mention right now is also at first exponential in the degree, but there will be improvements. Uh, so the second thing you might do is notice that since we're solving vertex cover via maximal matching, and maximal matching has a nice greedy algorithm, why don't we just figure out what the greedy algorithm would do? 
Okay, so just simulate what the greedy algorithm would have done on node u. What's the greedy algorithm for maximal matching? It's really trivial. You, so this is now sequential, not sublinear at all. Okay, so this is a greedy algorithm that we teach in, in um, algorithms class. You just go through edge by edge and arbitrary order, it doesn't matter what order you do it, but you should fix an order. Um, but edge by edge, if edge uv, if neither u nor v have been matched yet, then put edge uv into the matching. Okay? Otherwise, if one of them has already been matched, ignore it and go to the next edge. So that's the greedy algorithm, and it works. Okay, well, now, if I want to see if u has been put in the matching, I have to look at every adjacent u around, I have to look at every adjacent edge around u. Okay, and then I have to check, would the greedy algorithm have put me in the, in the matching? Well, I need to know, what do I need to know? I need to know, oops, I need to know if the adjacent edges that come before the ed, E in the ordering are in the matching or not. Okay, so I need to like, figure out the answer for all previous edges that have been considered. I do not need to know anything about edges that come after me in the ordering. I do not need to know that. Okay, the problem is this is not that helpful because and if you have arbitrary edge orders, you can have very long dependency chains. So what if I look at this edge first, this edge next, this edge, and, and I look at these orders along the line left to right, okay? Well, now I'm trying to figure out if this edge is, is in the matching or not. I have to sort of look at all these previous guys to the left to figure out where they put in or not. And really, I need to know, is this an odd or even number of steps from the beginning? So for that, I need linear time. So in general, because it's an arbitrary order, things could be really bad. You could have extremely long dependency chains. But if you assign a random order to the edge and tell the oracle he has to go according to this random order, order okay, so he should simulate the greedy on this specific random order, then it's still going to work because greedy works under any ordering. But you can show that the random order has short dependency chains. Okay, so because of this, you can get a much better algorithm, and with a few more heuristics, okay, you can get actually constant that's polynomial in the degree, and even nearly linear in the degree. Okay, so what that means is you can even get sublinear, so it won't be constant anymore, but even if you have a graph where the average degree is n, okay, so that means the input size of the graph is like n squared, you can still get a, an estimate for vertex cover, which is something like n log n running time. Okay, so much less than the input size. Okay, so I just want to say that this technique of, the, of simulating the greedy under a random ranking is actually a very useful technique. It was used by others um, for, an, for maximum matching, set cover, positive linear programming, um, and also as well the, the simulating the greedy technique under random ordering as well as the distributed algorithms technique. Both of these can be used for all of these problems. Okay, because there really has been a lot of work in the distributed community on what they call local distributed algorithms, which is a little bit different because for them local means the running time is constant number of rounds, but all the processors are working together. In our case, it's all sequential. But still, we can use their work, and we are. Okay. Okay, there's a lot of nice open questions here. The question is, can you make the dependence polynomial in the degree for these problems as well? I said before that for vertex cover, you can. But in general, that technique does not work, so these, there's a lot of nice open questions here. Um, you can get even better results for hyperfinite graphs. Uh, and that includes planar graphs, for example. Okay. So that's what I'm going to say about sublinear time approximation algorithms. Let me turn to another model. Uh, which I want to say a little bit about. Um, and this is the case where we have large inputs, as we had before, but we also have large outputs. Okay, so when you don't need to see all of the output, do you actually need to see all of the input? For example, if I want to compute the minimum spanning tree, but I don't need to see the whole output, do I need to, to compute the whole thing in order to see the parts that I want? That's the question. Okay, well, I think m many of you have probably guessed the answer is often no. Okay, so for example, locally list decodable codes, the input is an encoding of a large message. The output, the, I mean, the way I'm going to fit it into this model, the output is the, of the decoding algorithm is the large message itself. And now, if you just want to know what's the i-th bit 
of the original message, um, you don't need to look at everything in the large message. There are codes that you can design so that few queries are needed to compute the answer. Okay. Well, similarly with decompression algorithms, you know, if you have, if your input is the compression of large data, the output of the decompression algorithm is the original data. In order to figure out what was the ith bit of the original data, you don't actually, I mean, you, well, for most compression algorithms you do, but you can redesign your compression algorithms and lose something, but maybe not too much, so that you can compress well and still few queries are needed to compute the answer. Okay, so this is um, uh, a model that we'd like to, so these are sort of things that have been studied independently. We'd like to place them under one roof and make a single model that we'll call local computation algorithms. There's some large input, large output, and what you'd like is a local computation algorithm where you make queries to this local computation algorithm, and it's, it tells you, you ask it, okay, I want to know about location 10, location 20, in Y, and it will make some queries to the input and tell you, okay, here's the value at location 10, location 20, location 53, whatever you ask for. So it's sort of a query machine. Okay, what more can be done in this model? Well, um, this is really just sort of a new model. I'll mention some things that can be done. Uh, what about optimization problems? Can you figure out in a job shop scheduling situation which machine should have taken this job? Uh, Maximal independent set, is this node in the maximal independent set? Uh, is uh, the vertex cover problem that we talked about earlier is another case, uh, various types of problems. Um, these techniques work as in the Oracle reduction framework, but the Oracle requirements are more stringent uh, because before what, one of the nice things we had was you didn't have to get the right answer for every input, here you do. Okay. So that's uh, one of the issues. I should mention, this has been looked at in a lot of other settings for local algorithms for ranking web pages, graph partitioning, uh, property preserving data reconstruction. There has been a lot of work in these two areas. I don't have all the citations up there, but um, uh, just to give you a sense of the types of questions people have been looking at. Uh, and one of the things I like about this model is that you could imagine several copies of these local computation algorithms out there in the cloud. So that's, you know, we have to say big data in cloud in every talk these days. So, <laughs> uh, and notice that they're working in parallel, but they're not talking to each other. Okay, so they don't actually have to communicate in, in order to be consistent with each other, but they can still somehow answer about various parts of the input. So I think it's sort of an interesting thing to think about. All right, so what I want to talk about now, we talked about now, up until now, we were talking about what happens when you have no time, no time to view all the input, and no time to process it all. Now I want to talk about something that actually complements this, this model, and that's the question of what happens when you have no samples, okay? So, I don't think I have to convince this crowd that dis distributions are important, so I'm not going to. Uh, but I'm going to start with an example of playing the lottery. Well, you might want to know whether the lottery is fair or unfair before you decide to play it. Uh, for example, some websites claim that if you know past prediction, past uh, winners, you can predict the future. So that's good. Um, in fact, it's even a true story. So it actually. Uh, uh, thanks to Krzysztof Onak for pointing this out to me. Um, but the Polish lottery Multilotek has actually, um, it's, a, it's a physical machine with balls in it, and they take out 20 of the 80 balls, and that's the lottery winners for the day. Now, the initial machine they used was biased. The probability of 50 to 59 was too small. Here's a graph of what happened. <laughs> so you can imagine there were some big winners. So that might be one reason why you'd want to test your distribution uh, before you actually put money on it. Okay, so here's another example. I mean that, okay, notice here, you could figure this out because look how many, there were 300 drawings and already we had lots of samples of each domain element, right? And so we have a pretty good idea that this is much less than that, right? So there's, we're not worried about statistical significance, and we really saw every outcome many times. But let's take the New Jersey pick three and pick four lotteries. This, here the story is a little bit different, because you're gonna pick k digits in order, where k is either three or four. So, you're, so, 
so you're either picking three digits or four digits. In the first case, you have a thousand outcomes. In the second case, you have ten thousand outcomes. And let's even let me give you that the lottery is IAD. Let's trust them that much, okay? Okay. So now I, I have to confess that we um, we haven't redone these. Uh, trials since uh, 2000 and now it's 2012 so maybe this is out of date by now <laughs> but when we did this in 2000 there were 8,522 results from the pick three okay so there remember there's a thousand possible outcomes and there were eight eight about eight and a half times as many samples uh, so the, in that case when you run it through the chi-square test you get 42 percent confidence okay <sighs> four was worse because it started later so there were only 6,544 results and there they have 10,000 options well there chi-squared gave no confidence because you have fewer samples than you did the domain size so that's not good okay well when you have distributions on big domains um, and you get samples of the distribution, there's many properties of this distribution you might want to determine, you might want to estimate the entropy, you, wanna, you might want to know how many distinct elements are in the domain, you might want to know the shape, is it monotone, is it unimodal, is it close to uniform, is it Gaussian, is it Zipfian, there's so many questions you could ask about your distribution, um, and let's assume that you know nothing about the shape of this distribution. You don't know that it's um, continuous in any way. You don't know that it's um, normal. You don't know anything about this distribution. These kinds of questions have been considered by pretty much every group of scientists out there. So I listed some, and I'm sure there's more. Okay. So uh, there's even websites, I think, it, uh, that tell you how many people, how many different pe groups of scientists are interested in such questions. But the key question is, how many samples do you need in terms of the domain size? In particular, do you need to estimate the probability of each element in order to answer such questions? Or can the sample complexity possibly be sublinear in terms of the domain size? Okay, if, if you're getting sublinear, then this is going to rule out your sort of classical chi-square techniques and any type of learning the distribution and, assume, and showing that you got a, good, a very good approximation of the distribution. You're going to have to do something else. Okay, so our aim is algorithms with sublinear sample complexity, and we want to make no assumptions about the distribution. Okay, so I'm going to start with the example of testing similarities of distribution, because it fits in with our lottery question. We have two distributions, P and Q. Are they close or far? Okay, and we're going to take a couple of different models and see how this question changes when we have different assumptions on how P and Q are given to us. So P is always going to be given to us via samples. P is always something where I don't know P, and the only way I can access it is with samples. Q, however, let's start with a case where Q is known to the tester, and in particular, let's start with a case where Q is uniform. Okay, so I don't need to make queries from Q. I know that Q assigns probability 1 and N to every element. Okay, we could also think about Qs where it's written down for us, Q sub I for every single I. And I don't charge you for accessing Q. You just know Q, okay? Um, we can, and the second type of question we'll ask is what happens when Q is also given via samples? So you're getting samples of two distributions now. Okay, so the first question that you might ask is whether P is uniform. And it turns out that the sample complexity of distinguishing the case from P equal to Q, from the case where P is epsilon far in L1 distance from Q, is root N. Okay, so much less than linear. Before I talk about the problem of distinguishing P equals Q from P far in L1 distance, let me talk a little bit about L2 distance. Okay, so here's an idea of Goldreich and Run is they noticed that the L2 distance of P from uniform is actually the collision probability of P minus the collision probability of U. Now, let's assume we know N, okay? So N is something we know. So that means that if I estimate the collision probability of P, then I have a good estimate of the distance in L2, well, distance in L2 squared of P from the uniform. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're just going to estimate the collision probability of P and use that to estimate the L2 distance squared of P from uniform. Okay, that's all we have to do. What's it? One issue is 
we have to get a really good estimate of the collision probability of P because we, the collision probability of the uniform is 1 in n. So do I need to get an estimate to additive 1 in n of P in order to do this? Well, kind of, yeah, I do. Um, but it turns out that we can do this with, square, with order of square root n samples by recycling our samples. What do I mean by that? Well, sort of the naive way of estimating the collision probability would be to take two samples, see if they collide. If they do, set an indicator variable to one, otherwise zero, right? And then take two more samples, it's independent, set my new indicator variable to one, otherwise zero. Okay, so this would take linear and n samples to get an estimate. But what you could do is take some constant times square root n many samples and look at all pairs. Okay, and again, set the indicator va variable, if sample i and sample j are the same, sigma ij is going to be 1. Okay, but we'll run this over all pairs ij. So every sample is getting reused many times. It's being compared to every other sample. So now we're getting something like square root n choose 2, which is linear in n, many pairs of indicator variables, which are not all independent, so we can't use our favorite Chernoff bounds and um, chernoff hufting bounds, but we still can use, we can still bound the variance and use um, our normal variance bounds to get this, and that works. I should mention also Paninsky has slightly improved on this in terms of epsilon, and he uses a different estimator, so there is other ways to do this. Again, using root n samples, but better in terms of, ep of epsilon. Also, this is pretty much the best you can do. You cannot do a whole lot better than root n, and the reason is this. So we have the uniform distribution, but let's consider a distribution that you construct as follows. Take s to be a random subset of half the domain, and then take the uniform distribution on s. Okay? Well, any algorithm that solves this d uniformity problem needs to be able to dis distinguish uniform distribution on S from the uniform distribution on the whole domain because their L1 distance is very far apart. Okay, so now this algorithm is getting samples. It doesn't know if the samples are from S, uniform distribution on S, or uniform distribution on the whole domain. Furthermore, it can't see anything by the names of the elements it's seeing because S was chosen randomly and the algorithm has no idea. Okay, so all it can do is look at collisions. And it doesn't see a collision in S either until root n samples. Well, some constant times root n. Okay, so, so basically until some collision happens, it can't tell the difference. And that's why you need root n samples. Um, and in fact,